Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Lawton. I'm the Director of Knowledge Exchange here at Farm Credit East, and I'll be introducing our presenter today. Uh, we're pleased to have Ms. Kendra Senna, Senna, who is the Senior Staff Attorney at the Government Law Center at Albany Law School, where she conducts law and policy research on issues related to state and local governments. Her current research is centered on the role of state and local governments in immigration law. After earning a JD from Harvard Law School, Kendra was awarded the Irving R. Kaufman Fellowship for Public Interest in recognition of her exceptional promise for a career in public interest law. Kendra has represented individuals, class, and institutional plaintiffs in employment and civil rights claims with a special emphasis on the rights of undocumented immigrants. She has also served in the Council's office in the New York State Senate. Prior to becoming an attorney, Kendra worked in social services with refugee and migrant farm worker families. So I'm very pleased today to introduce Ms. Senna. Um, this is a very interesting and a little bit scary topic, but uh, I think that Kendra is going to um, really help us make some sense of it. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ms. Senna. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. Um, thanks to Farm Credit East and to the New York Farm Bureau for inviting me to present today about immigration enforcement at the work site. So let me make sure you can see my screen. Looks good. Okay, great. So this webinar is presented in partnership between the New York Farm Bureau and the Rural Law Initiative. The Rural Law Initiative offers legal assistance to entrepreneurs, small businesses, and farmers in upstate New York. The Rural Law Initiative is a pilot project housed at the Government Law Center at Albany Law School and has satellite offices in Herkimer, Otsego, and Schoharie counties. So the Government Law Center is where I work as an attorney. Um, and I have to say that this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to provide legal advice, and it's not a substitute for advice from an attorney, and it doesn't give rise to an attorney-client relationship. So that's the boring stuff. Let's begin. Uh, today we're going to talk about immigration enforcement at the work site and your rights and responsibilities as a business owner if immigration comes to your farm. And I'm sure that it will not come as news to any of you listening that immigration enforcement actions at places of business have surged in the last year. These numbers are from the Department of Home Homeland Security, and you can see on this chart, investigations of employers increased about 400% in 2018, over the same numbers in 2017. You can see here that I-9 audits were up even more than that. Criminal arrests at places of employment have increased to um, about five times higher in 2018 than in the previous year. And administrative arrests at businesses, so arrests of people without criminal charges were up almost 900%. And that's just arrests at places of business. Those numbers are staggering. And these actions have had a devastating effect on farmers and on farm workers. Now, of course, this is a very complex issue. This webinar is not intended to unpack the many moving parts that have created the situation we're in today. But over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to dig into just one aspect of it, and that is what you can do to prepare yourself in the event that immigration agents show up on your farm. So there are two main reasons that immigration officers may visit a place of business. First, they may conduct an inspection of a business's I-9 employment authorization records. And second, they may conduct an enforcement action to find and detain people, documents, or property within a business. And as a business owner, you should be prepared for both types of visits. There are serious consequences to inspection and enforcement actions, both to the business um, and to the employees. For example, employers can be fined and in some instances criminally prosecuted. Fines range from $110 for a document error to we've seen as high as 16,000 for knowing and repeated violations. Um, workers, including authorized workers and sometimes even US citizen workers, have been detained and deported, which obviously has a devastating effect on the business, to say nothing of the effect on the individual and the community and the family. Um, and finally, businesses can be barred from federal contracts if they're found to be in repeated violation or really grievous violation of these laws. 
but you and your employees are protected by state and federal laws, even during a federal immigration inspection or enforcement action. And so that's what this webinar is gonna go over. Some of those protections and how to prepare yourself um, in the event that immigration comes to your farm. So our goals for this short session are to review the difference between inspection and enforcement, the difference between private and public spaces at your business and your rights in those spaces, the difference between judicial warrants and administrative warrants, and spoiler alert, you only have to comply with one of those. And also we'll cover some concrete action steps that you can take before, during, and after a raid. So this webinar is gonna focus on enforcement actions, but I do wanna say a bit about inspection, because often inspection is the first interaction a business has with immigration officers. And if there are problems with an inspection, it may result in an enforcement action. Now, of course, we see lots of enforcement actions that come out of the blue and don't have anything to do with inspection, but sometimes inspection comes before an enforcement action. Um, so we're gonna talk about some basics of inspection, just to be sure we're all familiar um, with sort of the, the basic tenets of, of what that looks like. So inspection. Federal law requires employers to complete an I-9 form for each new employee to verify their identity and eligibility to work in the United States. An I-9 form must be completed for all employees, including US citizen employees, and retained for inspection by federal agents. The basic requirements look like this. You are required to complete an I-9 form for all new employees. You complete section one on or before the employee's first day, and section two within three days of hire. You are required to keep I-9 forms on file for every current employee. And for former employees, you have to maintain the forms for three years after their hire date or one year after their termination, whichever is later. And this trips up some employers. It means that if you have a currently working employer employee, they have an I-9 on file. If you have an employee who, say, starts to work for you and quits after six months, you need to keep their I-9 form for three years or because that they've worked for you for less than that three-year period. So it's, it's always the longer um, of the number. All current employees should have an I-9 and former employees should have an I-9 for three years after their hire date or one year after their termination. So, um, you know, do the math every time to make sure you're not getting rid of your I-9 forms before you're able to. So the next box here is you're not required. Um, the federal government makes it clear you're not required to be a document expert. And in the government's own instructions to, the, to employers, it says that you should accept documents that reasonably appear to be genuine and relate to the person presenting them. So it's not your job to know what different, you know, documents from varying countries look like um, or really get into detail about whether or not this is a, a verifiable document. Your job is to accept documents that reasonably appear to be genuine and relate to the person, meaning it looks like the person in a photo ID who is presenting them. You're also not required to keep copies of the documents that an employee presents. A visual inspection is sufficient, but you can keep documents if you want, copies of the documents if you want, you just have to be consistent. So you either always make copies of your employees' documents or you never make copies of your employees' documents. The final panel here is things that you're not permitted to do. You cannot request more or different documents than are required to verify employment eligibility. You cannot reject reasonably genuine looking documents or specify certain documents over others. The federal government has already determined which documents are acceptable for these purposes. And you as an employer are not permitted to have a preference of one type over another. Those are decisions that the feds make and are not for you to make. You're also not permitted to discriminate by asking for more or different documents from a worker based on their race, ethnicity, or national origin. So for example, if a school ID is an acceptable form of ID from your American workers, then it's also an acceptable form of ID for your foreign-born workers. Same goes for language, you can't ask for more or different documents 
from your Spanish speaking employees or your Haitian Creole speaking employees um, because of their language. You need to treat all of your employees the same. So we're not going to go into details of filling out I-9s. Um, the federal government maintains a pretty helpful website for employers on completing I-9s, including timelines and sample documents. And I put the website up here for the, the place where you can find that employer handbook and it's pretty helpful so you can print it you can download it or you can browse it online from that link so while you don't have to submit these forms to the federal government federal agencies may inspect a business's i-9 forms to ensure compliance officials from the department of homeland security employees from the immigrant and employee rights section at the department of justice and employees from the Department of Labor all have the authority to inspect an employer's I-9 forms. This is called an I-9 audit. The purpose of the I-9 audit is to check for errors in the completion or the retention of I-9 documents that make it more likely that an employer has hired ineligible workers. If the federal government wants to review your I-9 forms, they begin with a notice of inspection or an NOI. You're entitled to three days notice prior to review. There's a timeline on the USCIS website that I gave you in the slide prior where you can see how the inspection process plays out. Often there will be requests for additional information like payroll records or a list of current employees. And if any discrepancies are found, you generally have 10 days to make corrections. Um, and all of this is subject to uh, the government granting requests for additional time and we often see that if an employer says I need thanks for your NOI I need more than three days to get these together the government is usually pretty good about giving employers additional time or more time than 10 working days to correct an error but each scenario is distinct of course based on your particular record so if you're subject to an inspection I recommend you speak with a lawyer about your particular situation but here are some high-level things to remember um, the best way to avoid liability is to conduct periodic self audits and correct any mistakes that you find along the way. It First, it shows your good faith to comply with the law. Um, and that always works in your favor in the event that you are subject to an audit and some discrepancies are found. If you're doing periodic self audits, it shows that this is something that um, your business takes seriously and that you're trying to stay on the right side of the law. Um, here are some tips about uh, self-audits. So keep your I-9s separate from employee personnel files. If you're subject to an audit, you only need to submit the requested files. And if you have your I-9s mixed in with all of your other HR materials, it one, it's harder on you, but also two, it makes it more likely that you end up turning over extra files. Um, and I never advise my clients to turn over anything extra. Um, until it's asked of you from the federal government. So if they're just looking for your I-9s and then possibly some additional material like your roster, um, you want to be able to, to easily access the files that will be subject to an I-9 audit. So the second bullet there, make sure all of your current and your recent employees have an I-9 on file according to the rules. So again, for former employees, you keep the forms for three years after their hire date or one year after their termination whichever is later. Third bullet there, if you have workers with temporary authorization, which a lot of farmers do, be sure to update their I-9s when the authorization expires. It's something you don't have to do for folks with um, legal permanent residency, a green card, or US citizens, even if they hand you a passport that has an upcoming expiration date, you're not required to update, but you are required to update for temporary workers. And if you discover a mistake, you are responsible for correcting it. So you can make the edit right on the original I-9. You just strike it out, correct it, and date it, and initial it. Don't use whiteout. The government is very clear that they don't want whiteout. Um, if you have to complete a new one, maybe there are so many edits, uh, or the original has become illegible and you need a new one, you just attach the original with a short memo explaining the changes. And if you're missing an I-9 form, then complete one. You enter the actual hire date and the date the form is completed. So if you, it turns out that one of your current employees doesn't have an I-9 when you go back to your business and complete a self-audit, you 
will fill out an I-9 for them using the first date that you hired them. But when you sign it and date any um, things that you enter, you use today's date. So they will have different dates on them, but the government doesn't want you backdating anything. Again, the, the USCIS manual is very helpful for filling out I-9s and correcting mistakes. So take some time to familiarize yourself with that. If you haven't had a look at it yet, it'll be helpful if you have any questions. And that website again is USCIS.gov forward slash I-9 dash central. Okay, We're switching gears a little bit. Let's talk about enforcement. The key difference between inspection and enforcement is that inspection is on the papers and enforcement is on the ground. So even when you're served a notice of inspection, an NOI, you're entitled to three days before you have to turn anything over. The NOI, the notice of inspection, does not on its own give immigration agents the authority to enter your business inspect your buildings or interview your workers. So keep in mind that the notice of inspection is just that, it's a notice of inspection of your papers. It's not an immigration enforcement action and you don't have to treat it that way. An enforcement action, by contrast, this is commonly referred to as a raid, is when immigration officers come to a work site without warning uh, and their goal is to detain people, detain documents or property within a business. Um, Enforcement action or a raid might follow an I-9 audit that has shown a lot of discrepancies. When that happens, typically the business owners, um, it's you know, you know, without notice, so they are surprised on the day, but it's not typically the first time that they've had interaction with ICE or the first time that they've heard from ICE that there are discrepancies in their files. Okay, so let's do the who, what, where, and then we'll move on to the, some concrete action steps. So enforcement. Who might conduct an enforcement action? Field agents from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, DHS, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. That's who conducts enforcement actions. Um, people typically refer to them as ICE. ICE is a body, as a part of Homeland Security, um, but broadly speaking, we're talking about uh, quote-unquote ICE agents. They are not police officers, but they often will wear uniforms that say police or vests that say police. And sometimes when they conduct raids, they're accompanied by local police officers. Recently in New York, we saw a raid where the ICE officers identified themselves as ICE, but they wore plain clothes and they didn't give over any official IDs, which was of course pretty terrifying for the farmer. Um, he didn't know who they were or they were demanding access to the farm, they were demanding access to certain people, and they just looked like you know, a regular person um, off the street, which was pretty scary, but that's not typical. Usually we see them in some kind of identifying uniform or vest, but you should know that it has happened. Next, the what are they looking for? So ICE agents may come to your business looking for documents, property, or people. Uh, in terms of documents in an I-9 audit, a business is entitled to three days notice to produce the documents for inspection. There is such a thing as an I-9 raid where ICE agents want to inspect or confiscate documents without notice, but they have to produce a judicial warrant. In property, in order to inspect or confiscate property, that might be computers or servers, ICE should produce a judicial warrant specifying the property subject to inspection or confiscation. People, if ICE wants to arrest someone at your business, they must produce a judicial warrant for their arrest that states the name of the person subject to arrest. And for all of these things, I've said judicial warrant, judicial warrant. The other way that they can have access to your documents, your property, or your people is with your permission. So either you say, yes, come on in, or they have an order from a court that says that they're allowed to come on in. And of course, they're, they're limited to the scope of the warrant, but if people run, ICE may have a legal reason to arrest them, and we'll talk about that a little bit in, in the future, but generally, we're talking either your permission or a judicial warrant. So finally, where can they go? Um, and this is the distinction between public and private spaces. Anyone, including federal agents, can enter public areas of your business without your permission. The public areas include parking lots, lobbies, restaurant dining areas, sales floors, 
farm stands or retail shops that are open to the public. If it's open to the public, that means public. And federal agents are part of that public. So they can come to any space that you have on your farm that is open to the public. ICE agents may not enter private areas of your business without either your permission or a judicial warrant. And private areas include back offices, kitchens, factory floors, fields, which surprises some people. Fields are considered private spaces. Uh, worker housing is private and any other area that you don't have open to the public. So there are a couple fail safes in both inspection and enforcement. You have a right in an I-9 audit to three days notice. So it's never gonna creep up on you, you get that notice. And in a worksite enforcement action or a raid requires a judicial warrant. So there's at least a fail safe there that this has gone through the right channels um, from a judge. Okay, so now that we know what to expect, who to expect, what they might be looking for, and where they're permitted to go, let's talk about some things you can do to prepare. First, you should clearly mark private spaces. As a business owner, you have the right to determine which areas of your business are open to the public and which are private. So unless you give permission, ICE agents may not enter private spaces without a judicial warrant. So clearly mark those private areas that are not open to the public. You can post signs that say private or employees only or do not enter. And this includes on um, exterior premises of your farm, so fields or barns that are otherwise open to the air um, or may have uh, you know, a barrier alongside a, a public area like a parking lot or something else that is open to the public, but the barn, although it has an open breezeway, is not. Hang signs, just make it clear, this is private space. It's up to you to decide what that is. And uh, second there, train your workers and your managers not to give consent to enter private areas. Once you or your employee has consented, then you've waived your right to privacy in those places. Um, it's important to remember that if ICE comes to your farm, it's pretty likely that it won't be you, the farm owner, um, the first, as the first person that they interact with. It may not even be a manager. Their first point of contact might be a worker. And that worker trying to be helpful may end up giving consent to a search. I've seen this actually recently where agents came to a business and the front end worker, they had a retail space in the front and the worker was trying to be helpful um, and handed over some files that the agent asked for and also let him into the fields to talk to some workers. The owner wasn't even on site at the time and was really surprised that the worker could even give consent. Um, it surprises some people, you know, if, uh, nobody can give consent except for me, I'm the property owner, but it's, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, the law says that when someone who appears to have authority gives consent, that's enough to allow agents in without a warrant. So be clear to all of your employees that they're not to consent to a search without your permission. Third, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, keep your I-9 files separate. If you're subject to an audit or a raid for documents, you can easily access the files for review. If they're all mixed in with your other personnel documents, it makes it harder to limit ICE to the documents that they have permission to look at. And if you hand over something that's not part of their scope of their investigation, then they're of course allowed to look at it and use it um, in any case against you. So you wanna limit them to what they actually have permission to look at. Delivering, and of course, you know, I, just, I have to say this again and again, delivering a notice of inspection does not give ICE the right to review your files at the time. And we have seen in some cases where the delivery of a notice inspection, the agent says, well, do you have them available? Just turn them over to me now, save you the, the time of rummaging for them, mailing them, et cetera. And business owners have turned over their, their I-9 forms without having a chance to review them. It's your right to have those three days. So it's not a special permission or special dispensation from the government. It's in the law that says that you have three days to, to prepare those. So don't waive your three days of notice. You can just ask them to return in three days. There was um, a very public series of ICE enforcement actions across a number of 7-Elevens in New York City last year. In the media, it was referred to as a raid. A number of people got arrested all of the same day in several different sites of 7-Elevens. But what it actually was, was a coordinated delivery of notices of inspection. So because we all know that notices of inspection come with three days notice, 
it could have been handled just as that, like a delivery of a, a notice. But what happened in that case is either the people who received the notice waived their three days notice by handing over the files right away, or the presence of ICE agents um, spooked some workers who gave um, ICE reason to arrest them. So there's no reason that receiving a notice of inspection should result in a raid or arrest at the same time. So keep in mind that the NOI does not give them the right to see your files at the time. It doesn't give them the right to inspect your premises or interview your workers at that time. You can just say, thank you, we'll be in touch in three business days. <laughs> okay, fourth, the final preparation step is to establish a protocol. So a plan that you and your workers know how to implement if ICE comes to your farm. Remember that ICE's first point of contact may not be with you or with a manager, so this is training that should go all the way up and down the line. Um, my suggestion is that you assign a point person who will speak with ICE agents and determine the purpose of their visit. They'll ask to see a warrant, and we're gonna talk about warrants in a minute. They'll decline to consent to a search, um, and that includes if they give a warrant that doesn't require um, compliance. They'll contact you, or an attorney or another authority that you identify, and they'll document ICE actions. So you can train, you can establish a point person or two point people, but train all of your workers to refer the ICE agents to the point person and decline consent to a search. Employees can say, I don't have the authority to let you enter, please wait here and I'll get a manager. All workers have the right to remain silent, to ask for an attorney and to decline to sign anything. But that brings me um, to this important note that I put on its own slide because I think it's worthy of, of taking a moment to talk about. Please remember that the rights, responsibilities, and interests of your employees are different from yours. So your attorney should not also represent your workers, but you can connect your workers with attorneys or advocates who can train them on what to do when interacting with immigration officials. And I put the number here for the New Americans hotline. This is a state agency. Um, they themselves don't provide this kind of information, but they can help connect individuals, um, workers, groups of workers, or a farm to folks who might come, be able to come and do, um, give some advice on what to do if immigration comes. Okay. Now we're going to talk about warrants. So we've prepared ahead of time by marking private spaces, keeping our documents in order, establishing an action plan. Let's talk about what to do during a raid. Always ask for a warrant. You know that ICE may not access private spaces of your business without either your consent or a judicial warrant. If you don't give them permission to enter the private spaces of your farm, then they have to have a judicial warrant, so ask for one. Many, many raids that we've seen across the country do not have judicial warrants. Often ICE will have an administrative warrant from the Department of Homeland Security, and an administrative warrant does not give them the right to enter private spaces of your business. But many people are confused about the difference, and they look very, very similar. So let's spend a few minutes looking at the two warrants. Here they are. Okay, so you're looking at a side-by-side -side of a judicial warrant on the right and an administrative warrant on the left. So the first difference, a judicial warrant is issued by a court. So the, the document on the right is the judicial warrant, and you'll see the example here says United States District Court right at the top. It's also possible that a warrant could be issued by a state court, but the important part is that it comes from a court, and it will always say at the top of the document which court is issuing the warrant. On the left, you'll see that the administrative warrant is issued by ICE. So this one says U.S. Department of Justice, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. This is an agency, not a court. The second difference, and this is a slight one, the judicial warrant will either be a search warrant or an arrest warrant. So on the right, again, is a judicial warrant. This example is a search warrant. So it says search and seizure warrant. It will name your business, your business address, and the locations to be searched. An arrest warrant will say arrest warrant and name the person to be arrested. On the left, this one comes from ICE, you see warrant of removal or deportation. It might also say warrant of arrest. The final critical difference 
is that a judicial warrant will be signed by a judge. So on the right, you'll see at the bottom of the page, there's a line for the judge's signature. The administrative warrant on the left is signed by ICE, not a judge. So this one says signature of ICE official, title of ICE official. Nowhere in there is it signed by a judge. If it's not signed by a judge, it's not a judicial warrant. It's the, the key, key difference there. You must comply with a judicial warrant that's signed by a judge, and it will say U.S. District Court or State Court at the top. This is the law. You have to comply with a judicial warrant. You do not need to comply with an administrative warrant. An administrative warrant is a request from the agency. So this is, um, you know, like a formal document, an in-house document, where they're formally asking for your consent. So we know that they're not allowed to enter private spaces unless they have your consent or a judicial warrant. An administrative warrant is really just a way to ask for your consent. So you can say no. I mean, you can always give consent if you want to give consent, but you can also decline to give consent um, because this is just a request. It's not a mandate from a judge. Okay, during a raid. If you are presented with an administrative warrant, which is merely a request from the agency, you do not have to consent to a search. You can decline to answer any questions, including about a person, um, whether or not the employee is there today, whether or not that employee works for you, if you've seen them, where they live, you don't have to say anything um, when presented with an administrative warrant. You can say, this is an administrative warrant, and I'll only comply with the judicial warrant. You can decline consent in words out loud. I do not give you permission to enter. I do not consent to a search. And you can invoke your right to stay silent and to speak with a lawyer. I don't want to answer any questions, and I want to speak with a lawyer. None of those things are at all on the margins of the law. Those are fully within your rights um, in, when you're faced with an administrative warrant. Now, we have seen that ICE agents have entered anyway. My advice here is that if ICE agents enter anyway, don't obstruct them. Just state clearly that you don't consent and document their actions. So you are permitted to film, you can take pictures, you can write down what you remember. All of that is well within your rights in the state of New York vis-a-vis um, -vis federal agents or state agents or anyone else for that matter. If ICE presents a judicial warrant, read it and understand the scope of the warrant. It may identify a person to arrest, it might list certain locations to search or identify documents or property to seize. So first, check for an expiration date. A warrant sometimes, not always, but sometimes includes a date range for the raid to take place. If the date has passed, decline to consent. Also check it for accuracy. A search warrant should correctly list the address of your business and the areas to be searched. And check this carefully. You can imagine a situation where, you know, because of the nature of rural roads, ICE could actually show up at the wrong farm. And if they show you a warrant for the farm down the road, but you don't notice and you let them in, they can argue that you've given them consent. Of course, your attorney would argue that it was consent under false pretenses, but you don't want to have to go that far. It's much, much better just to read the warrant and make sure that it's accurate. Next, check that ICE follows the warrant. An arrest warrant generally does not give ICE permission to search the private areas of your business, even if the subject of the warrant may be there. A search warrant does give ICE permission to enter the private areas of your business as described in the warrant. If ICE goes outside of the scope of the warrant, you say out loud that you don't consent to the search. Again, don't obstruct the officers, but do document um, that you stated you didn't consent to the search and what they did um, during the course of the search. And then finally, document the actions of the ICE agents. Never obstruct ICE agents, but you don't have to assist them in executing the warrant. For example, we've seen some employers have been asked to sort their workers by status. So put all of your temporary workers here, put all of your um, you know, H2B visa workers on this end or all of your Haitian workers on this end. You don't have to do that. And I encourage you not to do that because that actually may open you up to some different liability. So you shouldn't obstruct them, but you also don't need to help them. 
So an, another important note, ICE does not need a warrant to enter the private spaces of your business if there are quote unquote exigent circumstances. So ICE may enter private spaces without a warrant to respond to an emergency, to apprehend a fleeing suspect, or stop the destruction of evidence. This means that if ICE sees people running, they may have reason to chase, even if that means onto private property or into private spaces of your farm without a warrant. So another good thing to train your workers and, and be sure that they're familiar with the consequences of uh, running from an ICE agent actually might create justification to chase that person and arrest that person where there may not have been that justification before. Okay, after a raid. If any of your employees has been taken into ICE custody, ask the ICE agents where they will be detained. We've always seen, for the most part, that the agents are open about where they're transferring the person. Um, and it's really important if you're available or other workers are available to, to ask that question. Um, ICE detention is somewhat complicated, including in the state of New York. And so where they go for the first night might not be where they are for the second night or the third night. So it will be very helpful to your, uh, to the families of your farm workers if they're able to track where their family member is. So of course, notify the employee's emergency contact or another appropriate person about where they're being detained. And consider how you might help your affected workers. I put that same number again to the New Americans hotline. They have a lot of resources for you as a business owner and also for your employees on the consequences of immigration enforcement actions. We've seen some people are offered bond, um, which means it's like bail, like you can post a bond to release them from detention. Um, you can consider paying it. Detention separates a person from their support system, makes it much harder to prepare a case. Um, of, of course, this is your legal obligation is to pay your employees for any work they have performed. So if someone is detained and they have money owed to them, you do have to pay it. Um, so you can speak with your employee to determine how they'll be paid. And then finally, report the action. Um, there are national and New York-based organizations that are collecting information about these raids so that employers can be better prepared, we can know what to expect and how to advise our clients about what to expect in the case of an immigration enforcement action. But we need to know what they are, when they happened, and what the details were. We know about the really big ones. Those end up making um, media waves but often the raids are smaller um, and don't get quite as much media attention. So it's helpful to include um, your experience into a larger collection of experience. So the, the folks in New York who are, are collecting this information is called the Immigrant Defense Project and their phone number is there. They also have maps of raids so you can see where people have been affected in your area or across New York. Um, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA.org, they collect maps nationally. So um, consider adding that information into the collective consciousness so that other, other farmers know what to expect. Okay, so as a review, um, listen, I know the immigration enforcement actions are disruptive and they're scary and can have devastating effects for farmers and farm workers, but you have rights um, under federal law and under state law. So it's important that you're familiar with it so that you can protect yourself, your business interests, and also your employees. Um, so we talked about the difference between inspection and enforcement, public and private spaces, judicial versus administrative warrants, and what to do during and after a raid. The highlights there, are knowing that public areas of your business are open to the public. So if you have spaces that you don't want ICE agents or any other member of the public entering, mark them clearly with signage. Um, there's no magic language here, so whatever signage is easiest for you to hang um, on your private spaces. Train your workers not to give consent to enter private areas. Remember to ask for a warrant and that you must comply with a judicial warrant which is signed by a judge and will say U.S. District Court or a state court at the top. You do not need to comply with an administrative warrant, which is merely a request from the agency. And then of course, stay calm, try not to obstruct or assist ICE agents, document the ICE actions and assist any affected workers. And 
remember, of course, that the notice of inspection for an I-9 audit is not a warrant, and you're entitled to three days notice before you turn over your I-9s. So I put my information here in case anybody has any questions about the material that we've reviewed today. I'm Kendra Senna. Um, this presentation was put together with a Rural Law Initiative, which is a project of the Government Law Center. So you can contact the Rural Law Initiative, you can contact me directly. Um, my email address and my phone number are there, and also the website for the Rural Law Initiative. And just as a plug for the Rural Law Initiative, there are additional resources on that website that you might be interested in. We have materials on um, corporate forms, on farm succession planning, and other things. So um, if you haven't, if you're not yet familiar with the Rural Law Initiative, um, check out my colleague's website there. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Kendra. Um, very important and interesting stuff. A uh, little bit scary for some of us listening in on this. Um, we do have some questions that have come in for people that want to answer, ask questions. You can um, type them into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, to get that panel, click on the, uh, the, the orange arrow on the right-hand side of your screen, and you will see a panel that says questions. You can type in questions, and we will do our best to get to all of them. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in, um, but before, I want to editorialize a little bit here in that um, the I-9 form, uh, Kendra touched on it sort of briefly in this presentation. Um, I-9s are much more complicated than, than even what Kendra um, presented. We did a, a, an entire webinar on the I-9 form that's available at farmcreditist.com slash webinars. It was uh, done in December of 2017, so a little more than a year ago, um, but most of the information is still pretty much valid. And it's important to recognize that despite the scariness of some of this um, ICE enforcement, it's uh, you are required by law to document that your workers have permission to work in the United States. You are prohibited from discriminating against workers who may have legal permission to work in the United States, despite their national origin, the language they may speak, or their ethnicity. So that's a case where um, employers really have to thread a needle there, and it's important not to uh, under-document. It's just as important not to over-document. So I would encourage you to um, take a look at that I-9 webinar for some more information. Um, and with that, I'll go into some, uh, some questions here. Um, what if employees see government, um, government vehicles come into your farm and start to leave? Um, does that create an exigent circumstance for the ICE agents? It's a good question. It might. Um, typically, the law says that ICE agents or any other federal agent or state agents for that matter cannot discriminate against a person based on their race, their job, um, their physical appearance, the language that they speak, et cetera. That would be unlawful discrimination. And so those elements themselves are not sufficient. So if a truck is coming in and they see that there are workers in your field or, or in your barn who match a certain description, that would be unlawfully discriminatory and they can't search that does not on its own present an exigent circumstance. But if they see running, um, that's really the, the, the action that we've seen that has created, quote unquote, an exigent circumstance. The reason being is that that person may evade arrest if, they're, um, if, if that's the person who's subject to arrest. You know, calmly walking, going about your business, deciding to take your break, those kinds of things are much more of a gray area. I would think that... Um, Running is quite clearly a cause for an exigent circumstance, but removing oneself from, from the factory floor or from the farm uh, fields is not sufficient. But typically for folks who are on short-term visas like that, um, if they have a reasonable expectation of coming back, then you don't need to update their form. So that might be seasonal workers who you employ every year. Um, on the season, then you don't have to update their form. But for a J-1 worker, because it has a clear end date, um, that end date, I think, is sufficient to say, you know, they're, they're not your employer after the expiration of their, of their visa. Does that, is that responsive? Yes, I think so. Um, okay. A couple of questions have come in about getting the slideshow and the uh, recording of the webinar. Um, it will be um, stored at farmcreditease.com slash webinars. 
and we'll try to get that recording posted um, by the beginning of the day tomorrow. Um, so that will be available um, for, for further viewing. Um, another question came in is that um, you did a, an excellent job of presenting all this information in a very calm and measured manner, but in real life, situations don't always go down like that. Um, if ICE agents show up in street clothes, don't show an identification, and have no police escort, uh, how should a, a farm owner respond to that? I, I'm with you. It is terrifying. It's a really, really scary time um, for business owners, for farm workers, for farmers. I, I mean, honestly, I don't really have great advice on this because it really, it seems to be a moving target. The best that you can do is keep yourself safe and try and protect your workers as well. Okay, uh, what about farms within 100 miles of an international border, which covers a good chunk of New York State? Are there differences in the um, rights of people and the powers of ICE and Customs and Border Protection? Yeah, this is a great question. For those of you who are unfamiliar with um, with with the, the the basis of the question, there is a constitutional um, constitutionally protected area of the United States, which actually encompasses a huge swath, something like 80% of the people in the United States live in this 100 mile border. But if you're within 100 miles of a US border, there are the, the Customs and Border Protection, which is an element of DHS, so distinct from ICE, has certain rights and responsibilities in terms of engaging with people who are interacting with the border. So we see this a lot in New York. New York is hugely within this 100-mile border because it counts um, ocean borders as well, water borders. So we've seen CPB agents, you know, enter like Greyhound buses or trains or train stations to do interaction, to interact with people who are um, using modes of transportation most typically. Customs and Border Protection does not do immigration enforcement actions on place, it, at places of business. So it is true that because most of our New York farms are within the 100 mile border, there may be more presence of Customs and Border Protection and you may see Customs and Border Protection, especially at places like bus stops, train stations, um, those kinds of things. But they are not the agency that is tasked with worksite inspection. So it shouldn't have an effect on immigration enforcement actions on New York farms, um, but it may in fact have an effect on how frequently your workers are interacting with somebody from immigration, but it is a separate wing of Department of Homeland Security. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in regarding I-9s. Uh, for seasonal businesses that often rehire the same staff, do you treat them as a new hire each year or do you just update an existing I-9 that you have? Yeah, so I alluded to this earlier. If you're, the standard says that if your employee has a quote unquote reasonable expectation of employment, then you don't need to, to consider them a new hire. So you would just update their I-9 um, or rather keep the same I-9 for the employee. Um, if you don't have a reasonable expectation of employment, let's say, you know, this is a, a surge in one of your productions or you typically have staffing that comes from a certain group of people who are not available that year and so you do some extra staffing on the other side, there's no reasonable expectation of their coming back on, then you do treat them as a new employee. But for seasonal employees who come back um, after the next year, they're not considered new employees for I-9 purposes. Okay, thanks. Um, one other thing, just to give a little bit of a commercial here for the information sheet that you put together, Kendra, um, that's available as a handout on, under the handouts tab on the um, on the webinar control panel, and it will also be posted on the uh, webinars page for the recording. So this is, um, you'll see up at the top the Rural Law Initiative again, um, where this project comes from and where I work the Albany Law School's Government Law Center at the top. This is one of several information sheets that the Rural Law Initiative has created 
specifically for rural business owners and entrepreneurs in upstate New York. Um, so this one is on the topic of immigration enforcement. It goes over a number of the things that we cover today. This doesn't talk about I-9s. It's really um, closely hewed to the enforcement theme. But you'll see some of like the links that I mentioned. These are maps right here for enforcement actions in New York and nationally. Um, you'll see a review of the difference between judicial warrants and administrative warrants. So, and then of course, this is a much, much shorter document than um, the PowerPoint. So I do recommend, you know, if you need something that you want to share with your, with your employees, your managers especially, or to, to give you something brief um, to cover some of the enforcement action issues that we've covered today, uh, this is a really good document that, that keeps in line with the enforcement piece of what we discussed today. So that's available to you as a handout on the right side of your screen. Um, and I think Farm Credit Ace is also going to put it on their website. And then it's also one of a series of materials that the Rural Law Initiative has put out um, for upstate businesses. So you'll see my cursor is here, albanylaw.edu forward slash rural law resources. So there's some um, additional things you might find interesting there. Great, thank you. Um, another question, you, you mentioned some resources specific to New York State, such as the New American Project. Um, do you know if other Northeast states have similar programs to these? Uh, many of them do. I don't have their contact information with me um, right now, but most, so the Office of New Americans is through the Department of State of the State of New York, and most states, if not through their Department of State, have a project that is targeted in this way. Um, so the Office of, of, of New Americans and New Americans Project is likely a good spot to find those neighboring states resources. So my suggestion would be to call them. Um, there's a lot of regional coordination on a lot of these issues. So it's not at all surprising that those folks would know very well who the right person to talk to in a neighboring state would be. Okay. Um, we're coming up on one o'clock, so I'm just going to um, ask maybe one more question here. Um, this is a little bit complicated question, but um, if an employer tries to assert their legal rights, but ICE agents either misrepresent their, the, the documentation that they have, the warrant that they're giving, or they're uh, aggressive and go areas where they don't technically have permission, um, are those things that could be presented as um, defense in um, against sort of fines or proceedings that happen after the raid? Yeah, um, they are, which is why it's important to document um, what ICE agents are doing. And like I said, you have, it's your right to film, to take pictures, to take notes. We have seen ICE agents, some ICE agents in these circumstances are fairly aggressive. Um, so I hate to do that calm voice again when I'm talking about something really, really terrifying, but there it is. Um, but yes, document if you feel safe doing so with photographs, with video, with writing, and certainly when they leave, write down all of your impressions. Those kinds of actions are illegal. So this webinar um, is about your constitutional rights. So there, if, if federal agents are violating your constitutional rights, it is absolutely part of your defense. Um, and even potentially, you know, an offensive against the federal government for taking advantage um, of you in a space where you have tried to assert your rights and they've essentially trampled upon them. So yes is the short answer and the longer answer is I'm very, very sorry to say that this happens. Um, so do pay attention to it, do be prepared for it um, and absolutely consider that as part of, of any defense that you have to to not just immigration violations on uh, in your place of business, but also more broadly, um, how we as a community and business owners can make certain that we're holding our agencies, our federal agencies to the standard that's outlined in our constitution. Okay, great. Um, and with that, I think we've got to most of the questions um, that we could answer here today. I'd like to thank New York Farm Bureau for co-sponsoring this and helping put it together, the um, Albany Law School, um, as well as Kendra specifically for presenting today. Um, any final thoughts, Kendra? No, I mean, my contact information is there, so if anybody has any other questions or wants some help being pointed to resources, I'm really happy to be in touch with folks. This is, you know, it's a pretty scary topic. 
Um, so the best we can do, I think, is, is talk about it and keep one another informed um, so that we know what to do to prepare. Thanks very much. Thank you.